some counterclockwise rotation. Oh, there you see it, right there. there. It is. You've got some debris on the ground. Tornado on the ground right now. You're seeing it live. Tornado on the ground over West Springfield. And uh, get inside, get into your basement right now. And then we saw the debris flying and we all yelled, get in the cellar, let's go, let's go, it's here. Because in Massachusetts, you don't really expect to see uh, a tornado. You use you, the warning, you know, just brushes it off. It was getting louder and louder. And I looked out, to, I was sitting right inside on my chair. And I saw that tree go down. I grabbed her and we headed for the basement. And I knew what was coming. It has been over eight years since the Western Massachusetts EF3 tornado has left its nearly 40 mile long path of devastation. Over the course of an hour, homes and businesses were destroyed, forests mowed over, and lives changed forever. Little did anyone think that Massachusetts could find itself in the crosshairs of something that traditionally rules the Great Plains. But on the afternoon of the 1st of June, 2011, that convention would be changed forever for the city of Springfield. Hampton County in western Massachusetts is the home to the city of Springfield, which is considered to be the hub of western Massachusetts. Settled in 1636, it became incorporated as a city in 1852 and has been the largest city in western Massachusetts ever since. Springfield is best known for being the birthplace of basketball, author Dr. Seuss, and being the home of the Springfield Armory. Western Mass is in a world of its own, given that the state's capital, Boston, is a two-hour drive to the east, and the next closest major city is the sister city of Hartford, Connecticut, which is a 30-minute drive to the south. Even so, Springfield is home to over 150,000 people and a collective 800,000 called Western Massachusetts home. The Northeast has been known for some wicked weather. Traditionally, it has come in the form of blizzards and nor'easters. On the late afternoon of June 1st, 2011, however, Western Mass would be experiencing something nothing quite like they have seen before. 2011 was already a historic year for tornadoes. On April 27th, the largest tornado outbreak in the country's history occurred in the southeastern United States. 360 tornadoes touched down in a 48-hour period, including four EF-5s, 11 EF-4s, and 22 EF-3s. 324 people were killed and over 3,000 injured. On May 22nd, a massive EF-5 devastated the city of Joplin, Missouri. That one tornado alone killed over 150 people. Flashback to May 29th, 1995 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. The small Berkshire town of Great Barrington lies only miles from the Massachusetts-New York border. During the late afternoon over the Hudson River Valley, a line of storms developed with one cell in particular developing into a significant supercell. At 6.40 p.m., a tornado touched down in Columbia County, New York, and would go on to cause F2 damage before lifting. The supercell was far from finished, and at 7.06 p.m., another tornado was on the ground, and this time it was taking aim at Great Barrington. The tornado tore through the Great Barrington fairgrounds and continued into the woodlands. As it continued, it crossed over Route 23, and the tornado picked up a car from the road and tossed it a thousand feet into the woods. The tornado crossed into Monterey, the next town over, and died before reaching the center of town. In the wake of the devastation, three people were killed and 24 injured by the Great Barrington tornado. Although it caused F3 damage to structures, the car thrown from Route 23 earned the tornado an F4 rating. This rating is still disputed to this day. This wasn't the first intense tornado to hit Massachusetts. Worcester County was hit by an F4 on June 9, 1953. The tornado grew to a mile wide and devastated the city of Worcester and the neighboring communities. Due to the lack of warnings, it went down as the deadliest tornado to hit New England as it killed 94 people. During the days leading up to the 1st of June, severe weather was to be expected in the Northeast. A low pressure system over Quebec was driving a cold front into a sweltering New England. The baking temperatures in New England, plus the advancing cold front, would lead to definite severe weather. On the morning of June 1st, at 9 a.m. local time, the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, had given the region from the top of Maine down to northern New Jersey a 5% tornado probability. 
As the day wore on, the atmosphere over western New England grew increasingly unstable as the values for convective available potential energy, better known as CAPE, grew up to 4,000 joules per kilogram. There was also growing amounts of low-level shear in the atmosphere, meaning that the atmosphere above western New England was ripe for supercell formation. At 1 p.m. local time, the Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch extending from New Hampshire to southern New Jersey. Storms were just beginning to fire up over New York and eastern Pennsylvania as the cold front advanced into the region. These thunderstorms grew rapidly over the Hudson River Valley, and by 2.15 p.m., the first cells were working their way into western Massachusetts. These storms were quickly given severe thunderstorm warnings as the current cells began dropping 2-inch hail, and they possessed 60-mile-per-hour wind gusts. At 3 p.m., a new cell was developing east of Kingston, New York and started to track northeast. The first tornado warning over Massachusetts for the day was issued at 3.30 p.m. over Hampshire County and included the western Massachusetts cities of Northampton and Holyoke. The storm that had developed over Kingston, New York had moved its way over northwestern Connecticut and was about to become the dominant supercell. The supercell changed from a northeasterly motion to an eastward direction over western Hampton County as the supercell fed off the storms to the north. At 4.17 p.m., just south of the big Y you see behind me, the tornado touched down. The tornado started its 39-mile path of devastation beginning in the Munger Hill section of Westfield, Massachusetts. Damage was confined to downed trees and to part of the roof of the Munger Hill School. At 4.18 p.m., a severe thunderstorm warning was issued for the supercell, but the National Weather Service was unaware that a tornado was on the ground. The tornado was still organizing by the time it passed over Robinson State Park in Agawam. Multiple trees were snapped and some uprooted as the tornado gathered strength. Law enforcement in Westfield report that a possible tornado touched down in Munger Hill as they find damage along Shaker Road. Following at a pace of 35 miles per hour, the next city in the line of the tornado's sights was West Springfield. As the tornado entered West Springfield, it still lacked a well-defined condensation funnel and the only evidence of its presence was the debris now being lofted by the tornado's winds. The National Weather Service issued a tornado warning at 4.30 p.m., but for the people of West Springfield, it was already too late. The tornado made its way into the Merrick section of West Springfield. The Merrick section is one of the most heavily populated parts of the city. Here on Union Street, some of the worst of the damage could be seen. 88 homes and businesses in West Springfield were destroyed in a matter of minutes. For those that were in West Springfield, they didn't know that there was a tornado coming their way until it was practically on top of them. Many large, multi-family homes were destroyed in the tornado as it maintained its strength. While this was going on, local news stations were broadcasting the tornado from their sky cams in Springfield. The tornado crossed the Connecticut River and people watched on their live television the horror as the tornado ingested river water and debris whirled around the main circulation. On the memorial bridge behind me, motorists watched as the tornado lifted a semi-trailer and threw it on its side. The tornado strengthened as it entered the city of Springfield. It crossed Interstate 91 and motorists had to duck below their dashboards as the windshields blew out on their cars. Springfield South End neighborhood took a direct hit as historic brick buildings were destroyed and homes were torn apart block by block as the tornado continued into the Six Corners neighborhood. The tornado moved swiftly, which would then make a direct hit on Cathedral High School, effectively destroying the school. By this time, the tornado was a well-defined tornado. Videos of the tornado are taken from Western New England College and the Veterans Golf Course as the tornado works its way into the 16 Acres neighborhood of Springfield. When the tornado was done with Springfield, well over 500 buildings and homes were destroyed. The next community in the path of the still strengthening tornado was the town of Wilbraham. The tornado went just to the south of the Minnetog Regional High School as it tracked eastward. On Doppler radar, the storm began to look like an alarmingly powerful supercell. Similar to the one seen only a week earlier in Joplin, Missouri, the EF5 that killed over 150 people. Several more homes and buildings were damaged and or destroyed, but the tornado showed no sign of weakening as it caused major deforestation in much of the rural community. 
the evidence is still present here today, over eight years later. Some of the houses in the 16 Acres neighborhood in Wilbraham were completely leveled. These Springfield suburbs were hard hit, but the tornado lined up for the next community to the east, Munson. The tornado reached near peak strength here in Munson. The center of town was directly in the path of the tornado. Munson was one of the hardest hit communities as the tornado tore through the center of the small town. 77 structures were destroyed, including the town's police station. More houses in Munson were swept completely away. The tornado grew to a half mile wide as it entered the next community, Brimfield. At roughly 5 p.m., the Brimfield State Forest was obliterated as thousands of trees were snapped and uprooted and multiple homes were destroyed. The Village Green Campground took a direct hit from the tornado. Of the 96 campers and RVs on the campground, all but one were completely destroyed. The National Weather Service updated their tornado warning as the tornado continued into Worcester County. The warning stated, This is an extremely dangerous tornado with a history of major damage. On radar, the supercell thunderstorm and tornado looked like something that belonged in the Midwest, with the debris ball signature. Sturbridge was next as the tornado crossed Interstate 84, south of the center of town. The tornado's width was shrinking, but it still packed some punch as it destroyed multiple homes in Sturbridge. The storm moved further east and the tornado entered Southbridge, and it went over the Southbridge Municipal Airport. Several aircraft on the tarmac were thrown into the woods, and hangars on the airfield sustained damage. The Rosemead apartments were severely damaged, and the tornado continued east. Several more homes on Worcester and Charlton streets were also destroyed. It was at this point where the tornado would significantly weaken, and by the time the tornado reached the edge of Charlton, Massachusetts, it was in its final stages. At 5.27 p.m., the tornado dissipated, ending its hour and 10 minute long raid. It was here in Charlton where the June 1st tornado died. In the end, three people were dead, over 200 injured, and nearly 1,000 people were left without a home. Emergency personnel from each of the affected communities immediately went into action as the tornado moved through. Only hours after the tornado, firefighters from the cities of Worcester, Boston, Newton, Waltham, Watertown, and Weston arrived in Springfield to aid in the rescue efforts. They went building by building, home by home to account for the city's residents. Miraculously, there was no loss of life in the city of Springfield. Of the tornado's three fatalities, two of which were in West Springfield, a mother was killed as she shielded her daughter in a bathtub while her home collapsed on top of her, and a young man was killed when a large oak tree was thrown on top of his car. The third fatality was in the Village Green Campground in Brimfield, when a woman was killed in her RV that was destroyed by the tornado. On June 2nd, the National Weather Service surveyors from the Taunton, Massachusetts office came in to assess the damage. In the 16 acres, Wilbraham, and Munson areas, multiple homes were found that had sustained damage from winds of around 160 miles per hour, placing this tornado as a high-end EF3 tornado. Shelters opened up in the communities affected for the hundreds that were displaced by the tornado. The National Guard, Red Cross, and FEMA assisted in the recovery efforts. Structural engineers went through building by building and house by house to deem if they were still structurally sound. Multiple buildings and homes in West Springfield, Springfield, Wilbraham, and Munson were deemed unsavable and were demolished, including Cathedral High School in Springfield. Even eight years later, evidence of the tornado is still apparent. In the heavily wooded communities of Wilbraham, Munson, Brimfield, and Sturbridge, the path of the tornado left is still visible from space. The tornado churned up roughly 10,000 acres of forest, and the trees have still yet to recover. Where there was once holes in the Springfield South End, it is now occupied by MGM Springfield, the first resort casino in the state of Massachusetts. Pope Francis High School now occupies the grounds of the former Cathedral High, as the Springfield Diocese merged two of its Catholic high school bodies, including the one of Cathedral. Out in Brimfield, 
the Village Green campground has since reopened, despite the direct hit from the tornado. Life in Hampton County, though, has moved on. But that does not mean the memory isn't still there. Ask any resident from the towns that were hit by the tornado where they were and what they were doing on the day of June 1st, 2011. And everyone will know exactly where they were and what they were doing on the afternoon of the 1st of June, 2011. Thank you.